83% of the matter in the universe we've never seen, we've never detected, and the only evidence for its existence has presented itself to us because of its gravitational effects. Being naturally of the creative sort, we physicists have given this invisible substance the name dark matter. The main evidence comes from galactic rotation curves. Simple explanation, it's a graph of the speeds of stars at different parts of the galaxy, expressed as a function of their distance from the center. Now there's a relationship between a star's kinetic energy, its speed, and its gravitational potential energy. And what we find is that stars are moving a whole lot faster than they should, given the amount of mass we actually see there. There has to be some extra cause of this centripetal acceleration. People have suggested a number of explanations for this missing mass effect. Possibly our theory of gravity is totally screwed up, I hope not. Possibly cloud of wormholes, that was suggested in a rather humorous paper published last month. Most people think it's some sort of particle. And in fact, we've given this special type of particle a name, weakly interacting massive particle, or WIMP. That basically sums up everything we actually know about it. As I said, physicists tend to be creative. I use the symbol chi for it. Chi is actually the symbol for a light of supersymmetric particle, one of the candidates for WIMP. My work is actually general. Even if it's not an LSP, I'm still using the symbol chi. As I said, WIMPs don't really interact with much. They don't interact with light, and they don't appear to interact with ordinary matter either. But we don't know that they can't, and that's where our research comes in. We do know that they're distributed in roughly a spherical shape. This um, white band is the Milky Way galaxy, and this cloud is the what we call the dark matter halo. It's actually solid in the middle, a number of different models suggesting different densities. But the best way to study something that we know so little about is to rule out what it probably isn't. And the best way to do that is to see what kind of properties could it have that could lead to situations that we don't physically see. Easiest one to do that is to look at its scattering probability. How does it? How strong probably could it scatter off of ordinary matter? Well, the way we measure the probability of scattering is through the cross section. It's a measure of the target area around something it would have to hit in order for it to lose energy. It's a measure of probability in area units. We're not starting from scratch. There's been a lot of work done before to rule out what the cross section could be. We don't know the mass of a WIMP, so we have to leave it general in terms of the mass. GeV is big electron volts is the unit of energy that particle physicists like to express for mass. Proton is the mass of about one GeV. So to do the perspective, the cross section for a proton bouncing off of another proton would be about right there. Now the brightly colored regions, blue, purple, and yellow, are already ruled out. The blue region indicates particles that have a cross section large enough that they would scatter somewhere in the Milky Way. You can faintly see dashed green lines. These are the minimum cross-section in order to cause the Milky Way galaxy to be disrupted. That doesn't happen, so we say it's actually the maximum cross-section you could have. Solid green line is a little bit better. It's the minimum cross-section it could have in order to create a gamma ray energy signature that we don't see because a wind is scattering off of cosmic rays. We don't see it, so that's also a minimum. Purple region, particles that have cross-section in this area would make their way down to the Earth, probably scatter somewhere in the atmosphere, maybe in the upper layers of the Earth's surface. This region was ruled out by my professor, Dr. Mack, in his doctoral dissertation by showing that the Earth would heat up too much by gravitational capturing these particles, and then they start annihilating each other and creating a lot more heat than there's actually there. Now, if a particle makes it through several layers of rock, it should scatter in the underground detectors. We've got placed in several continents looking for dark matter. We haven't seen it, so we can rule out this yellow region. Tan region is still uncertain. The gray region, we've got satellites that have collected data there. They weren't looking for dark matter. There's been a lot of questions as to whether they are conclusive. So we're leaving it kind of gray as being uncertain. The planetary heating scenario was the, what Dr. Mack did when he looked at the purple region. And that's where we started our research this summer. The idea is that a particle is going to scatter off of an oxygen target and eventually slow down to below the Earth's escape velocity. Well, if this happens, it's been gravitationally captured. And eventually, it's going to, these particles are going to collect in the center of the Earth. Because they're neutral, we assume that they are, they are an antiparticle. Neutral particles often are. 
A neutron is not a neutral particle, by the way. It's a collection of a bunch of charged particles called quarks. And they'll start annihilating each other. And we can calculate how hot the Earth's going to get. In fact, Dr. Mack found it would be two orders of magnitude, almost 100 times hotter than the Earth actually is. So we can reasonably say that any cross-section that permits 90% of the wimps passing into the Earth to get captured is going to be ruled out. I extended this argument to look at the gas giants, which have a hydrogen target, and found that the internal heating was roughly the same order of magnitude as the actual internal. Now, we basically know why the planets heat up. There are some pretty well-established astrophysical processes, differentiation and radiation. We can't really explain how we can add this much extra heat there. So we can say that these regions have also been ruled out. Now, this graph shows the gray region was done by Dr. Mack, looking at heating by Earth. And when we look at the gas giants, we expand this region into the black area. So we push it down and up which is why it was useful to look at the uh, gas giants. Now you notice there is a little white sliver there. That's because we need to, we have not looked, re-looked at the cosmic ray constraint yet. And if we do, we could probably push it down. That's future research. One quick note I'd like to make about this equation. We don't know about what the number density of dark matter is, but we do know the mass density. So if we divide the mass density by the mass, we get the number density. Mass cancels out that one, and we get a heating that's independent of what the actual wind mass is. So even though we don't know the mass of a wind, it doesn't matter for this case. Second constraint we did. As I said, dark matter is distributed in a spherical halo. What happens if particles in this halo collide with stuff in the galactic disk? Well, eventually, they're going to slow down to the same speed, and eventually become part of the gravitational system. The whole thing's going to flatten out and take a disk shape. That doesn't happen. So we can find the minimum cross-section that would require that to happen, and we can say that that's a maximum. That's a constraint that was first done 20 years ago in a rather chip shot manner by uh, Professor Stark and Gould, this out in the Apollos, and this is the result they got. Now they had to take an approximation where they said the width is a lot bigger than a proton, and they frankly were rather sloppy about it. So it was this term, actually, that they were sloppy about. The basic equation we're working with relates to the rate at which a wind is losing energy to the cross-section and the amount of energy it loses per scatter. I solved it in terms of the time derivative, which tau is the 5 billion years of the age of the galaxy. And I had to solve it four different times, because we don't know what angle they're going to fly at. I consider it a case where they fly head on. That's where they're going to lose the most energy, uh, most momentum transfer. And we can put the strongest constraints because it takes fewer scatterings to slow down. But a proton could be hit by a wind from behind, or they could scatter at 45 degrees or at 90 degrees. I had to look at all four cases just to cover my bases and solve the equations four times. And when I solved the equations, I got the following system of equations. Taking the high mass approximation, where m sub pi, the mass of a wind, is bigger than m sub p, I was able to get linear expressions for all four of them, which I could compare to each other and to what was done 20 years ago. And my constraint is two orders of magnitude better, um, which makes us happy. Uh, it's almost a hundredth of the original limit that was set, which means that we can say that this is now the maximum cross-section per scatter. I've graphed my work. These are not the approximations. Um, this straight line is the approximation done 20 years ago. As you can see, my line is quite a bit lower. And I superimposed these lines over the planetary heating constraints to show how they overlap. And once we get this little sliver covered, we can say that this line down here is now the absolute maximum. The reason why I have two lines is because I did consider four different angles. So this top line is the weakest constraints that I could have put. It's a 45 degree collision where not as much momentum is transferred. And the strongest constraint is a head-on collision. <laughs> now I also considered um, the presence of helium in the galactic disk. 23.8% of the disk is helium. That doesn't actually end up affecting matters any um, when you take a weighted average. The nucle helium nucleus is coherent, but in general, it's good enough to simply discuss hydrogen. You would have another line right below it if it were really there. And 
And so that's the work I did. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Mack for his guidance and mentorship this summer. I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for their generous support. And of course, I'd like to thank Ohio Wesleyan University for their generosity and hospitality in providing me a place to live and making this research possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>